grade. This is one of our 10 slides for the week of April 6th through the 10th. And just wanted to make it bigger for you guys. Um, this is called Composition with Red, Blue, Yellow by the artist Piet Mondrian. This is done in 1930, oil on canvas. And he is part of a style that's called the Distill Movement. Um, and it's spelled D-E-S-T-I-J-L, um, which actually stands for the style. So if you wanted to just put that off to the side so you can remember what that means. Um, he's also classified under another type of a style um, that you might have wrote down. It's called the neoplasticism plasticism, uh, movement. So I would just make sure, have the digit still, and then you can also put um, underneath that the neoplasticism plastic, movement. Um, so for this particular piece, um, the composition, hence the title, um, is called, again, with red, blue, and yellow. Um, it's composed of being on a very small canvas. This is 18 by 18 inches um, length and width, so it's more in the shape of a square overall. Um, so it's very, very small. Um, and it's composed to, if you're reading the con article, they were very specific on the wording. They said, to the simplest of colors. So referring to Central, essentially the um, colors that make up the color wheel. So you have your three primary colors. You got red, blue, and yellow. And then you have additionally white and black. Um, the simplest of forms. It's broken down to rectilinear uh, rectangles and squares when you look at how each of the shapes are broken into. And you can clearly see that. And then it's even defined further by just vertical and horizontal lines. And you can even tell on some of the um, lines themselves that they're a little bit more weighted than some of the other lines. So he really has made some distinctions between um, the size of each of the squares, rectangles, the placement of where they're arranged, and we'll get into talking a little bit about um, how this is showing asymmetry. Okay, we're not seeing any um, symmetrical balance here um, with this primary shape, the square, taking up most of the space. So definitely this could be categorized as asymmetry. Okay, um, we do see brush strokes, however, they're not going to be painted painterly. We're not seeing any type of um, scene going on. This is more purely on the abstract level. Okay. So um, one thing that if you wanted to know for the composition, excuse me, the use of diagonals, um, which would suggest deep in space, he he avoids all completely. He does not have any kind of diagonal in this particular piece. It's strictly rectilinear, up and down, vertical, horizontal. Um, and basically what he's trying to encompass is um, being able to establish purity and balance with color schemes and shapes. So looking at this long enough, you might be able to get a sense of some, some purity and some balance. Um, they create a sense of harmony and the way that they're placed, the way like the red square is placed, it's pushing um, pushing each of the squares and rectangles into different spaces. And that has to deal with like some color psychology. So when you have, um, for instance, like a warm color against like the cool color, one color is going to kind of stand out more than the other and the other will kind of recede and go back and the other, the warmer color will kind of um, pop out further. And I think we started to talk a little bit about that when we were looking at Paul Gauguin's where are we, where did we come from, where are we going, um, and his type of color palette that he used. Okay, so to continue on, um, we're in this new type of movement style. Again, we're in the 1930s at this point in time. Um, this is, again, it's called neoplasticism, but it has nothing to do with plastic, referring to the plastics. It's um, a new type of a media that we're exploring, um, such as sculpture, um, taking three-dimensional forms and really wanting to go beyond just painting the natural depictions and instead focusing on the actual material. So we're really paying attention to the oil on canvas um, and its unique properties that it has the ability to um, express other than just what we've normally at this point have seen as far as um, normal depictions of everyday 
um, occurrences. Um, so instead, we're seeing purely abstract, just purely form. So I just I can't um, express that enough. So such as line and color, those are two of our elements of art, line and color, uh, that really focus on this particular piece. Okay, um, he believed that how people used to paint, like for the academies, how they would paint their um, scenes, um, that he believed that abstract uh, could provide a truer picture of reality than the illusionistic depictions of objects um, in the visible world. So again, he's ca classifying this as an abstract real painting. Um, however, when he first started off painting, he did go the more traditional route. He studied in the art academies. Um, he's from the Netherlands. He's a Dutch painter. Um, he did follow the contemporary styles, the Impressionist, Neo-Impressionist symbolism. Um, he then kind of went on the deep end, not deep end, but he went on the um, side of rebelling against the classics, the academics, everything that we saw very painterly and beautiful in Paris at this particular time. He's shifting to that new kind of group that Picasso and Barack are part of. Um, it's called the analytical cubism movement, okay? So they're really focusing on line, color, geometric shapes, which we all can see being present in this particular example, um, and really exploring the multiple perspectives um, in exploring these multiple perspectives. Um, he did move to Paris, I have down, in 1912. <clears throat> um, he then actually returned home to the, the Netherlands right when the First World War was um, starting to outbreak. So, and he basically just stayed there until the end. But while he was in the Netherlands, he was able to further ex um, develop the style, concluding that um, asymmetry, okay, asymmetry, again, is where this is a perfect example where you see the majority of the canvas itself with this being a square um, the majority of the color and the shape is this red square and how if you were to go right down the center it wouldn't be balanced on either side so it's showing more weight um, showing more emphasis on this particular square we would classify this as asymmetry okay um, that asymmetry arrangements and and geometry like these particular um, squares and rectangles that we're seeing not like organic shapes not like that we see in nature like circles or um, things that just have um, just more of a you know sh shape related to maybe even like science like cells things that just look more oblong that don't have an actual definition to a shape things that are curve is what I'm trying to say um, and primary colors best represent universal forces he's really emphasizing again on trying to create harmony in the world um, again this was at a time when the wars were breaking out so he's really trying to find some sort of balance not only probably in his life but in in the chaotic chaotic world that was um, unfolding right in front of him so he really began to have interest in philosophy and spiritual and his belief of the evolution of abstract was a sign of um, humanity's progress. So he's thinking past the Impressionism, past Neo-Impressionism, um, past Symbolism. Um, let's go explore further into something more on a stream of looking at shapes and abstract, kind of going back to basics. So again, this is composing of also talking about opposites. So we see the use of black and white, vertical and horizontal lines. Um, and this is something part of a um, society in Europe that he that was interested in opposites. It's called a theosophical society. <laughs> I'll spell that for you. Um, it's T H E O S O P H I C A L. You might have wrote that down about some of the background information about where he kind of is, is coming from. And basically, again, what they're wanting to do is just um, suppress the physicality of um, creating a realness on a canvas where opposites can come together and create a dynamic equilibrium. Um, they believe that. Um, there was an interest in the modern environment, um, how they can unify humankind um, and simply just respond to these geometric forms in the same way um, people do with simple um, complex or excuse me, with um, complexity in modern paintings that we had seen up to up to this point.
that really basically concludes this particular um, this slide. I don't really have anything else to kind of just go over. Just make sure you have um, how he first started off um, being more on the contemporary side, and then he shifts off to this anical cubism side, which we're going to start to really explore when we start to see Picasso and Barack this week. Um, and then just again, it's more rectilinear, no curves, trying to find some sort of harmony and balance, some sort of unification, um, and specifically you could tie it to what was going on in the world at that particular time. Okay, all right, this concludes for composition with red, blue, and yellow, over and out.